It's, it's action time. <laughs> it's recording, so whenever anyone's ready, I mean. Oh, that's what Mike says. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what do you say? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, well, thanks for coming once field. again. In front of the hills. <laughs> to, the, to the new moon meeting. You guys give me hope to, to keep trying because other than this, I'd probably give up. You know, obvious, the place isn't taking off like I wish financially, obviously. But it, the knowing you guys support me and being at these new moon meetings that keeps me going and keeps me trying hard to keep get something going in this country and, and get this nation squared around. It's like you know, this house is kind of a thing of beauty, but it's it's not near completed and and it, it has a long ways to go. And that's why I feel about this nation or this country. You know, America was a beautiful place and. It's going to be an even better place, but right now it's it's a need of a lot of work, and so we've got to get people to start working together, and that's kind of what this Greening House project is about. A lot of you've heard my spill before, some of you haven't, so I'm going to kind of just hit some things real quick, and I'm going to have Hagen, he's going to be the main speaker, and I'm going to try to tie in what what uh, what I'm doing here with what he's doing. Because it's important to understand. Anyway, this is the Greening House, the first one. Hopefully there will be th thousands, if not tens of thousands of them down the road. They're going to be the start of a new system, if you would, of, uh, that kind of coincides with the system that we have. It's, I'm not trying to fight with the beast or anything, but we are, I think if anybody knows what's going on in studies, scriptures, you know that we're in trouble, you know, that there is a system out there that's corrupted, and for lack of a better name, it's called the beast, you know, and uh, we're all tied into it somehow, and, and the thing is, we're all going to, I feel, we all have to do something to start making steps so we don't end up taking them, getting chipped in the long run, you know, and being like cattle branded and, and doing all our trading with, uh, with their system, and a lot of this stuff, you know, it's, it's coming. I think anybody that reads Revelations studies it can see it happen. And uh, so I'm trying to just basically lay some groundwork to get people to start seriously bartering and trading on the on the slide, you know, or on the side, so that if it, if it comes down to the point where the government's forced to, and I know good people in government, it's not your general person in government, but if if the ones in charge try to force this chip on us, because that's what their goal is, if anybody studies it, but to basically make a cashless society, at least we'll have an alternative. And, uh, so that's kind of what this greening house is, is about, it's, and, and it's about, hopefully down the road, making these greening houses <coughs> a kind of a clearing house, you know, little banks, so to speak, where people can use tally sticks, which most of you already, uh, you heard my talk about tally sticks, which is a means of bartering that people can can create their own their own currency, if you would, and up, and pass them amongst each other as a as a way, way of bartering. And then on an international level, we can actually use these tally sticks with this Bitcoin, which I hope Tom will speak a little bit about. And because this Bitcoin is something that's that can go on an international level, and it's, it's a it's a currency that's used through the internet. And if it's done right, they can't trace any anything or track you, so it can't tie you into their system. And uh, so that's what it's all about. When you know, we're basically debt slaves, and a lot of people don't understand that. They they really think that, you're, that we're free Americans, and we're not. We you know the idea. Let's we back up some here. To me, what America means is basically it kind of goes way back. To, I think to you know the promises. And that's, I always start off meetings with an ABC, by the way, and uh, like, like, always be childlike or um, Americanism before communism. What was the last one? Anybody remember? Every month I try to get it. Um, actually be committed, I think. Yes. Yeah. People want to commit me, I know that, but no. no. <laughs> what other we'll succeed. <laughs> but anyway, this month is Abraham's Blessed Covenant. 
And does anybody recall what the covenant was? Well, if, if you recall, God, God's covenant to Abraham was that all nations in the world would be blessed through him and his offspring. And that's what, what I'm trying to touch a little bit on right now is who is Abraham's you know, offspring and, and uh, who is Israel? And do you recall where, where the name Israel started from? I have it here. I actually had a scripture at home. I was going to read like a half a page, and I forgot it. So, but I, somebody brought it up to show you. Uh, and I just want to read basically where the name, because a lot of people don't understand. Until you understand who you are, or what nation we are, you're, you're you're missing a lot, because we are Israel. We are the descendants of Abraham. And Jacob, you know, and his name was changed to Israel, and then, you know, the twelve sons of Jacob, and became, you know, descendants, which, through the, you know, the whole Caucasian thing was when the, all the this twelve tribes moved across the Caucasus Mountains, that's where the name Caucasian comes from, but we were basically the nation of Israel. And now, you know, people are so confused because of a lot of the Zionist Jews, the Rothschild Zionists, not the true Jews, how they've manipulated the whole mindset of everybody, so nobody really knows who Israel is. There. They think of it as a little country over there, you know, you know this little border, or, and not as the nation of Israel, which is everywhere, you know. And we are, like I said, that until we get our nation together and, and, uh, and become a force that, that straightens out a lot of the wrongs in the world, we're going to continue to be led down a lot of wrong roads. Mm. And uh, so that's where, you know, where I think we need to get is to get people to get back to you know studying their scriptures, getting together. You know, there's a lot of good leaders out there, but I'm a, I think a lot of them are just afraid to uh, conflict with the powers that be, because the powers that be got control of the monetary system, and and I think we all know kind of how twisted things can get. And now we're living in a you know we actually became slaves for lack of a better word. We by the, uh, you know, the way that they've taken control of our monetary system, which, like I said, a lot of, a lot of acts of deception, a lot of things that's happened over the last 100, 150 years, you know, that's, it's destroyed, really, the true American ideal, you know, of being sovereign, being independent, and, and uh, a free people. Now we're, now we're not. And because we are debt slaves to their system, we won't be free until we, I feel break away from it, and and I don't want to. I don't know. I'm the last one because I know how much I depend on the system as well as anybody else. So it's hard to fight, you know, because you don't know, you know, what. You know, everybody's afraid of losing their livelihood or this or that. So. <coughs> anyway, here's and, and he said, "Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel, for as a prince thou hast power. Hast, for as a prince thou hast thou power with God." and with men, and has prevailed. And Jacob asked him, and said, Tell me, I pray thee thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. So, that's when we get into that. So, hey, that's where I'm going with this. You know, we are blessed to be in this country. I believe that America was the start of the, the blessing that was to be fulfilled through Abraham. In the latter days, you know, the, and until we wake up as a, as a people and a nation and understand, you know, there is evil in the world, there's forces of light and there's the forces of darkness, and you have to sometimes take a stand and, and you got to understand, you know, what's going on first. And if you're not willing to put your neck out a little bit, you know, we all got to be brave or we're going to be, well, I think you see what's already happened in the last... Yeah. 50, 100 years, you know, it's, get, it's going from bad to worse, and, and I, it just scares me. I'm just proud to be associated with men like Hagen, you know, men like Tom, you know, men like Jim and Doug, and any, all you guys, I'm, I'm proud of all you guys for, you know, most of you have, you know, the courage to even come here. I know a lot of guys that, that laugh at me, you know, because I think I'm off the wall or whatever, and I wish half the stuff that, you know, the conspiracy theories that I, throw out there to people that, I know, I wish they would prove them wrong. I tell them that constantly, you know, I, 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 I constantly, you know, these guys tease me, and I said, well, I'll tell you what, here, you know, I'll make a bet with you. 
you watch this documentary, you know, like the 9-11 one, and they said, you just watch this documentary with your family, and if you, you know, I'll put $100 down, if you come in the next day and tell me there's nothing going on here, you can have my $100, but if you say, that stinks, then I get your $100. I can't even get anybody to take me up on that bet yet, and I've asked quite a few. But and it's not just the 9-11, that was the story of World War III, really, when you understand the big picture. And, but it, <coughs> they're hitting us on all sides of genetic, the genetically modified food. If, you, if none of you have seen a genetic roulette documentary, better watch it. But there's also, you know, what in the world are they spraying? It's another great one. Um, what else? Some, uh, the Great Calling? The, yeah. The, the Great Calling. Calling. That's what I tell people. Hey, you know, when they, when they start out, I say, well, I'm calling you out. Say, what? I said, well, watch this documentary called The Great Culling. C-U-L-L-I-N-G. The culling is the thinning of the herd. A lot of people don't know that word. I said, well, that's what's happening. Now it's the great culling. They're thinning the herd up. And if we don't wake up and put a stop to it, I hate to say it, but we're going to be, we're going to be burying a lot of people way before their time. Because their, their agenda is to thin out about Two, at least two thirds of the population. Is that ninety percent? Well, I, I hear you hear that too, but I, mean, I hear anywhere from two thirds to ninety percent, and it's happening. You see it every day. The more, I mean, I, when I was, I remember when I was in the '60s, when you heard about somebody having cancer, it's like, wow, wow, you know, it was a rare thing. Now it's every week. I hear somebody new that I know has cancer, or some kid has uh, some kind of weird disease, or you know, the autism and everything else, and and that's, that's another thing, the vaccinations. Here's where I got my eyes open, and I recommend this site, tetrahedron.org. If, if anybody ever heard of Dr. Leonard Horowitz, he's the first man that I've checked out when I started hearing him on the radio. This guy sounds bizarre, but he was the first doctor to prove the AIDS was created by our, our government. And I thought, that's bizarre, you know, but I actually traveled, this was like 10 or 12 years ago, and I traveled to Baltimore to listen to this guy, and Save a Patriot Network, Network hosted him. And this guy spoke for five hours, and I, like, man, I mean, he had a Harvard PhD, he had a couple different PhDs, this guy was an educated man. What they did was send him to, was, I don't know if you remember, in the early 90s, that one dentist killed about 20 people with the AIDS, infected him on purpose. Yep. Well... The dentist industry started losing millions of dollars with the business, so they hired this Dr. Hoare, which was also a dentist, but he had behavioral science training and whatnot, and they had him go down and check it out, try to put a new spin on things, get people's <laughs> trust in dentistry. Well, when he found out this guy, you know, he was a military dentist and he was a homosexual, and him and all his gay buddies end up with this, so when, when, after taking this hepatitis B shot, so this dentist from the military, he got the documents to prove some of the stuff, and, you know, when Horowitz started searching, researching, he couldn't believe it either. But the more he dug into it, the more he found out, and he, he has two books about this stick, I recommend reading them, I gave them out, I don't even know who now. But they have, like, documents from Henry Kissinger in 1968, to all the germ warfare companies asking if they could build something that would break down the immune system, exactly what AIDS is. And uh, then, they, then they end up showing what he shows where Litton Bionetics was the company that got the contracts, and our government gave him millions of dollars, and then he shows later on in the 70s how, you know, and he explains his books how they had to, why the AIDS was never here, because it, it's not something that your human body could just take in. It had to be genetically modified from chicken sarcoma and these different things that they had to do. And he explains it all in detail, and he challenged even these doctors that were involved with this thing. And, uh, he, you know, they, he can't get them to debate them in public or nothing, but Believe me, they're, they're aware of them, and so a lot of doctors, after hearing about Horowitz, you know, have, have also backed him and, and say that, yeah, there's something going on, they're definitely <coughs> part of the agenda, which goes, and he explains that in his, in his research, too, how this goes way back to, you know, the eugenics program and the Rockefellers and everything, you know, and so, I mean, it, it's corrupt to the core, you know, if you understand what the AMA and who started it and how it's controlled, it gets, it gets scary, but, um, uh, Anyway, I recommend checking out Dr. Horowitz, tetrahedron.org is his website, but uh, there's so much out, out there that we need to know about and to get um, people educated, so that's the only thing that, you know, that's going to change stuff. If, we, if, if people just keep sitting around not doing anything, you know, it's going it to be very disastrous. It's already yeah. getting very scary. So.
Anyway, I'm going to step down here and let Hagen, because what I'm trying to do with this concept, and that's why if this gets tied in with, with uh, a lot of other people, the idea, this is all set up in a trust. He, Hagen is the fiduciary of the trust. He basically controls, if anybody knows what a trust is. And that's what, we got to get people to actually trust each other and to understand, you know, the system and how it works. So that's why I'm trying to get people, to, you know, where if, if they get their properties involved in a, in a similar greenhouse project, you know, where they set up trust, the people could always at least have work somewhere like at these small farms or places that people are willing to put their self out there a little bit. But they basically recreate, we're trying to create work for people where you can go to a greenhouse anywhere and find any kind of, you know, hopefully a lot of farming, raising good heirloom seeds and good food, you know, teaching a lot of stuff, you know, and trying to get people educated and bartering, getting back to where you, you actually aren't using Federal Reserve notes. As long as you're using Federal Reserve notes, you're feeding the beast. You know, I hear everybody cry, ah, yeah, yeah, but everybody's still sucking off the tits, you know, and it's like, okay, when, when do you at least try to move away from that? You know, and if you're not trying, at least doing something, then you, we probably deserve what we're going to end up with, yeah. which is not good. Anyway, <coughs> Hagen, it's all yours. All right. Hey, how you doing? Well, I think I pretty much know almost everybody here, and you know me, so introduction to that extent I don't think is <coughs> necessary. But with what Mike is talking about, I'm going to talk about a few things here tonight about three different subjects. One of the subjects I'm going to talk about is called a common law pure trust. The other is a common law lien that gets recorded into the courthouse. And I'll explain all that as I go under each subject. I ran into a guy today, uh, I was in the health food store, DeWalt's there in Butler, and I know that, well I've been buying stuff there for quite some time, and the lady who owns the store told the gentleman who came into the store, I think, about me and what I do. So he came over and kind of a big, intimidating looking fellow, and started talking to me and um, He's telling me all these different things, you know, what's wrong in this country and about Obama and all these different things. And I said to him, I said, well, you know, the problem is not Obama. The problem is us. We're the problem in this country because we're ignorant. We don't know the Constitution. We don't know the system of government that our founding fathers bequeathed to us. So we are allowing these government officials to do whatever they want to with impunity. The fact of the matter was, and is, they don't have impunity, they never did. They're responsible, accountable, and culpable for everything that they do. But because of our ignorance, we don't know how to hold them responsible, accountable, or culpable. Culpability, if you don't know the meaning of that word, is a legal term that means you are responsible for what you do. Whether it be officially or it be personally, it doesn't make any difference. <coughs> The United States Code 42 U.S.C. 1983 makes it very clear that when they act outside of the delegated powers, they're acting personally, not officially. I felt the brunt of that statement by filing a case in, Pen in Butler here against every public official in Pennsylvania, including Governor Rendell. I had a winning case. The problem was I sued the officials. I didn't sue the private people. Had I have named them and sued them in the private capacity, I would have prevailed in that case. They weren't going to tell me that. I learned the hard way. And that's because of ignorance. So ignorance is it's not a shame to be ignorant. It's a shame to remain ignorant. I'm sure you've heard that statement. And ignorance is not necessary. If you devote yourself to the time of learning a little bit each day, You'll learn these things and you'll begin to use it and you'll begin to know how to hold these people responsible, accountable, and culpable for their actions. There's a course called Jurisdictionary I recommend to everyone. You can type it into the internet and pull it right up. He sells this course plus he gives <coughs> courses online and he teaches you how to use the court system. 
it requires some work on your own as well. I do, from time to time, hold courses myself and teach it so you have an instructor right there to help you through these things that will take the time and explain things to you that you don't comprehend. But this guy that I ran into just happened to be a legislative assistant to State Senator Scott E. Hutchinson. I know Hutchinson, I don't think too much of it. Very controversial, very uh, argumentative and confrontational whenever you bring an issue before them. Typically that's what happens with government officials. So I'm going to switch gears here, just leaving you with, get the Constitution and learn it well. Begin with that. I have some papers here that I'll leave here on the table that's got my contact information, my cell phone, my email, my, uh, and, and my address in Florida. And I will be available to answer any questions. I can't always spend a lot of time with you on the phone because so many people do call me that I wind up spending a tremendous amount of my time away from things that I really need to do, answering questions and talking. So what I try to do, and I'll tell you now so that you don't feel offended, I will tell you, get to the point. Tell me what it is you want to know, and I'll do my best to answer it to the best of my ability. But I can't sit here and talk about every subject that you want to all day or all night, because I have a life that I've got to live as well. But I'll do my best, and, and, and I'll answer the best I can, and hopefully put you on the right track. I also encourage you when I answer a question or give you a reference or something that you check it out for yourself. Okay. So now I'm going to go to first to the common law liens. If you have a mortgage or you don't pay your property taxes, they will take your property or close on it in either way and sell it. The Constitution prohibits that sort of thing. Your right of property is secured in the Fifth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. The U.S. Constitution is binding on the states as well. It makes it very clear in the Supremacy Clause at Article 6, Section 3, or Clause 3, that senators, representatives, judicial, and all executive, uh, and, and so forth, are bound, or to be bound, by oath or affirmation to support and defend the Constitution. Pennsylvania puts another word in there, obey, to obey the Constitution. It's both the federal or the U.S. It's not federal. The U.S. Constitution and the state constitution. The oath of office, James Madison made it clear that the oath was to be the chains that bind them to this document. Now, you ask yourself, well, how are they doing these property taxes then? Well, they have a statute, Title 72, that they claim gives them, enables them to tax you on your property. I find no such thing in Title 72, and I've read the entire book several times, and I can tell you clearly, there is none there. Because if they weren't delegated that authority to the state legislature, the state legislature can't give that authority to the counties through enabling acts. But even if they did, just supposing for a minute that they did, it's not there. It doesn't exist. And I have challenged them to prove it. Now, if, I, if you state a claim, let's say you send me a bill for $5,000. I'm going to ask you why. What did, I, what did you do for me that I would owe you $5,000? That's a rebuttal. I don't know. What, what, what service did you provide? How, would, how do I owe you this money? Fact is, I don't owe it to you. You're just claiming it. But you stated your claim. Now I've rebutted the claim. Your duty then is to take me to court. If you disagree, you take me to court and prove that I owe you this money. We had some sort of an agreement. You did something for me that, re that required me to pay you this money. And if you can't prove that claim in court, burden of proof is on you, not me. You stated the claim. I didn't. I just said, no, I don't owe you anything. Now, your property taxes is the same thing. They send you a notice once a year actually twice a year. One is a county and the other is school. And you sit there and you accept it as if it's law because they tell you it is, but they li they're lying to you. 
They're not telling you the truth. And if you challenge them to prove it, they can't. They won't and they can't. And Rupert here in Butler, tax assessor, retired early because I was bringing a lawsuit against him. He didn't even have an oath of office, so he was not an officer. He had no power whatsoever, but yet how many properties did he sell in Butler County during his career as tax assessor? He sold property after property after property. He is a criminal. There's over 36 felonies I'm charging him with for doing that. I don't intend to let him rest in his retirement, nor whoever takes over new to rest either. Because that is unlawful. We never granted that power to the government. Their powers are delegated. They're specifically defined. They're limited and restricted. Now, here's a way to get around some of the things constitutionally through this common law lien. If you purchase a property, I'm going to explain it to you. If you purchase a property, property is everything, including your labor, your thoughts, your land, your automobile, everything that you hold dear in your life is property. Now, you take a mortgage on a property and the bank requires you to put down 20 percent. I'm giving you some fictitious figures. You can apply them as they, as they do apply. So you buy a place for $100,000 and you pay $20,000 down. Now you pay on that mortgage for 20 years and you pay $50,000 in, on the principal. You now have $70,000 in equity in that house. The Constitution doesn't allow them. It says the, the property of the free man shall, meet, shall not be deceased. They shall not be deceased of the freehold estate. Your property can't be taken from you and sold for government use. Your interest in that property is $70,000. There's only $30,000 left. So if the bank wants to come in and sell it for the $30,000, they have robbed you of $70,000, your interest in that property. This is how you stop it. You file a common law lien, and I do those things, I will do it for you. You get the information, you get it to me for a small fee, I will do that for you. And if, you, if, if I'm in the area and you want me to go with you to the courthouse to file it, I'll go with you and see to it that it goes into the record. Now the bank can't come and take your property for $30,000 because you've got $70,000 into it because now they'll have to sell it for $100,000 to get their thirty because they're going to have to pay you the seventy. The, the title is clouded. Who would buy that property if they know there's a $70,000 lien on it if the bank takes it and tries to sell it to somebody else? Thanks. Give me $30,000 and they say, well, wait a minute. <laughs> it's a clouded title. There's a lien against this. Common law liens, there's only one lien that takes precedent over a common law lien. That's a mechanic's lien. If you hire a, a tradesman to do something on your property and you don't pay him, he can file a mechanic's lien in the same way you file yours. But his takes precedent over everything else. Because you have to pay. You made a contract, you've got to pay. That's an obligation you've got to pay. You're also obligated to the bank. But the bank can't take what belongs to you for their interest because you both have an interest in it. Now that that's said, that prevents foreclosure. They're not going to foreclose on that property and try to sell it for uh, $100,000 when they know they can't get it. For $30,000 it's owed to them and the lien, the they're being clouded. So we have several of them filed in Florida. Uh, we actually saved two properties from foreclosure by filing these common law liens. The banks don't want to touch it. The banks just left it alone. They didn't drop the case, they just didn't proceed. By rule, after two years of non-prosecution, the bank loses. You file a motion to the court for non-pros, the court will grant it. They'll give them an opportunity to show up in the hearing and to explain why they didn't go ahead with the prosecution and they're not going to do it. They're not going to waste the time, they're not going to waste the money, because they know it's a losing battle. The court's going to rule in your favor, and they know that. So it's not worth it for them to bother for $30,000. Now, you can plug the numbers in it any way you want. The one guy actually has 
into his property, and he owed only thirty thousand. Well, they're not going to get three hundred seventy-five thousand dollars for the property to start with. But he has that much into it. Now, there's several other variables that come into play. I said you only got seventy thousand dollars into into the equity. You also have others. If you had that property and paid for it for 20 years, you lived there for 20 years. There's a value to owning that property for 20 years. That value, I place a $3,000 per year value, which is not unreasonable. No one questions it. No one has yet. I know another guy that has over 1,000 of these. He's the one that trained me. He has never had anybody challenge that $3,000 amount. Okay? Now, you've made improvements on the property. So now, 20 times 3 is 60, so now you've got 60 and 70. That's what, 130000 And the bank's going to try to get 30000 out of it. So your lien now is up to 130000 But you made improvements on the property. And let's say you have another... $20,000 in improvements. That's $150,000. So you add all of these things up that you've done to the property and you have into the property, which is your interest. The bank's not going to mess with it. If it don't far exceed what you have on your lien, they're not going to mess with it. It's not worth, not worth it for them to do it because they'll lose. Now, the next uh, lien in line but they never do this. The county of Butler here, I didn't pay taxes for over 10 years. And they claimed that I owed them more than $15,000. They couldn't prove it. They never did prove it. But they claimed they had a lien against my property. And I says, okay, where's the lien? I want to see it. I know that the lien in order to be placed into the record by a government agency has to be done by court order. And I said, I want to see the lien. He said, well, it's down at the <coughs> recorder of deeds. I said, okay, I'll be right back. I went down to the recorder of deeds. There was no lien there. I told her, are you sure? Ed Rupert up there at tax assessment just told me that he filed a lien down here. I want to see it. She so said, Hagen, there is no lien against your property. Not here. So I go back up. I says, hey, Ed, you lied. Oh, did I say the recorder deeds? I meant the prothonotary's office. Be right back. <laughs> go down to the prothonotary's <laughs> office. Same thing. They said, he's a liar. They said it. <laughs> you don't have a lien against your property. Here's the book. Here's the deed book. Here's everything. Nothing's there. So I go back up. I said, you're a liar twice. And if you send me somewhere else and you lie, I'm going to punch you in your face. <laughs> you know, I said, you need to come clean here, pal. Well, we've got it here. I said, good, let me see it. Well, it's the thing you get in the mail. I said, that's not a, that's not a lien. That's a claim. And I rebutted your claim. And you have never taken it to court and proven it. So you see, now I'm working on a deal right now, a learning process. I, I already pretty much know it, but I'm going through a course also to perfect it to make sure I'm correct in everything that I'm doing. <coughs> this lien also will stop the property taxes. Because if they claim I owe $15,000 and I've got $500,000 in my property, who's going to buy that property with a $500,000 lien on it? And that lien's going on it this week. Let them do whatever they want. They haven't proved it. And, and until they do, and until a judge slams that hammer down with his order that they're to file that lien, they can't even file one. That's why there ain't one filed. They lie to you about it. It's all lies and deception. Deception is a lie. So that's the long and short of the common law liens. I would encourage you, whether you have an outstanding amount on property taxes or mortgage or anything else, to file a common law lien against your property because who knows when the IRS is going to come after you. You think the IRS is going to come after you for, for a $30,000 bill for a, for a $500,000 property? They don't want to mess with it, but there's another safeguard called the common law pure trust.
or a PTO. Now, I'm going to read you some stuff from the handbook. Next week, I believe, we will have our website up. There's this organization I started in Florida. I'm going to, uh, uh, we don't, this, this website is for them. This is one of the shirts that we had done. These numbers and so forth on here are not correct. It's my old phone numbers. I do have a, some uh, sheets here with the correct information on it with my new cell phone number. I also have the internet. The, the association is providing me with this stuff so that I can be available to everybody that calls and wants to answer and help with different things. I encourage you to join the Freeman Society. Start one here locally. Get your, do it organized. Get yourself a chairman, a, a secretary, a, 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 a financial officer, etc. And do things in an organized manner and contribute to that so that you can do the things that needs to be done. I will teach somebody here these things that I know on the common law peer trust and the, and the uh, common law liens as well as other things that I'm doing too. But do this. We d down there what we did was, was uh, ask people that could to donate $100 to get it started. Some of you in this audience did donate some to that. And I really appreciate it tremendously. Um, we set the dues at a reasonable <coughs> amount that we believe most people can handle of $10 a month. <coughs> if you get enough people, you can do a lot of things with that $10 a month. Being politically active, going after these public officials in a private capacity, these are the things that we're doing with the Freeman Society. I'll explain the words Freeman Society. This guy that I met today asked me, are you guys one of them right-wing extremist terrorist organizations? And I said, if you quote that, I will beat your face into the dirt. I am anything but that. And this organization is anything but that. I, I believe in our Constitution. I believe in our constitutional form of government. And if you want to know where it's at, read Article 4, Section 4 of the Constitution. It says, the United States shall guarantee to every state in the Union a Republican form of government. It's not a republic. It's not a democracy. It's not a representative republic. It's not any of those. China and Russia are republics. I don't want to be that. A, a Republican form means the law is written. People own the power. They loan some of it to the government. But they limit it, restrict it, and delegate it. They have no other powers than that which is enumerated in the Constitution. If they exceed those powers, transcend them in any way, they have violated their oath. They've acted outside of their delegation of authority. You sue them in their private capacity. In this group, I, I strongly encourage you, each one of you, to pick a topic in law and study it. Have regular meetings per month and come together and discuss these things that you've discussed together. And if a suit needs to be brought, any one of your members or anything else, you get together as a team just like lawyers do. Get together as a team and they can't defeat you. They can't defeat you because you're right. You're speaking truth. You're speaking law. You're enforcing it. And those who try to do anything but that, bring an action against them, including the prosecutor. These prosecuting attorneys, they're as vile and corrupt as they get. I love going after them. I love it. I, I, there's, there's, there's nothing that I enjoy more in this life today than going after a public official. Amen. I love it. It's fun. <laughs> but that being said, this means of protecting your property from the IRS, which we know is a global initiative. Any money that you pay to these people in government, check it out for yourself, does not go to that government. It's a means of controlling the money supply. That money that you deposit into the bank goes on a ledger and it goes to the Federal Reserve who shreds it and burns it. And they print new money through borrowing, through debt. This nation's in debt, you're in debt. You're a debtor whether you like it or not because you allow these things to happen. You know, the Constitution is very clear as to what our money system is. It's gold and silver only. Article 1, Section 10 makes it clear that no state shall accept anything but gold and silver in payment of debt. Article 1, Section 8 says only Congress can coin 
money. It doesn't say emit bills of credit. That's what that paper money is. And it's not money. But we know it as money because we don't comprehend the language. Now, I'm going to come back. You know, I just had to make those things clear. But I'm going to come back to the common law of pure trust. I'm going to read from you from it. This will be on the website. You can go on there and you can look at this stuff. You can read it. You can study it. You can do whatever you want. But I'm going to read the introductory to it. And then I'll accept questions after I'm done with what I'm going to read through. It's a little bit lengthy. I ask you to bear with me. Try to focus on what I'm telling you. If I'm boring you, I'll try not to. <laughs> Pure trust organizations are private contracts in trust form, protected from government intrusion by the Constitution for the United States of America at Article 1, Section 10, which states as follows. No state shall create any law impairing the obligation of contracts. A PTO is a lawful, non-statutory, artificial entity not subject to the taxation and endless regulations that government corporations, foundations, associations, nonprofit entities, and other created persons are. Now, that being said, some of you are familiar and aware of the word person, especially when your name's printed in uppercase letters. That's an artificial entity. It is not you in law. It's called ens legis. It's Latin. These government officials love Latin for some reason, especially lawyers. It's called ens legis. Look it up for yourself and you'll see it's, a, it's, a, it's an artificial creation by law. Creation of law. But here again, that's using the words loosely. Because law and legal are two different things. Legal is statutory by statute. Law is by delegation of authority through the people. Law is consistent with the Constitution, what we've allowed them to do. This booklet teaches how to maximize the effect effectiveness and property protections of a pure trust organization. It is necessarily brief and thereby does not cover these issues in or as in-depth manner as possible. We invite you to conduct, conduct your own research to your satisfaction. The primary reason people create PTOs is to preserve privacy. The secondary reason is to reduce liability. When properly utilized, a PTO wraps an ironclad wall of protection around any kind of property, either real, meaning existing in fact, or personal, individual or private, tangible, real or actual, intangible, existing only in connection with something else. I'm going to stop right there for a minute because I want to tell you something. When I do a common law pure trust for you, I do a deed of transfer and record it into the county recorder of deeds. In Florida, it's the county court clerk. He does all this stuff. Another lawyer, another racketeering scheme. When I transfer this stuff into the trust, it's an exchange. It is not a sale. It is nothing but an exchange. You exchange the property into the trust for 100 units of beneficial interest. You no longer own it. It is yours, but you, it's not in your name. You have no liability. You don't own it. That's your protection. It stops IRS and everybody else. They won't mess with it because they, they can only come after you, the man. They can't come after your trust because you own beneficial interest. But by doing so, you also learn to talk differently. When you're talking to someone, you don't say, well, my farm, my house, my car. You start to call it the house the car, the property. Because if you open it to statutory uh, rule, then you open the trust and these people can, if they've got proof that you're doing this, that you, they, and they will file a motion into the court saying, well, he, judge, he only did this to avoid taxation. Okay? You'll get a little more of what I'm saying as I go along here. Um, Environmental Protection Agency, uh, Internal Revenue Service, Federal Housing Authorities, and so forth, and any other so-called federal or state regulatory agency cannot touch it. If you have it in trust, and you'll find in a few minutes, there's, a, there's what's called a fiduciary officer. That fiduciary officer has a responsibility. He doesn't have a liability, but he has a responsibility of defending your property. Most people want me to do it for them, and I'm happy to do that. I charge a fee for it, 
but I'm happy to do that because if I've got to go to court or something, that's expensive. And I've got to spend all of my time doing this stuff, writing the documents, doing all these different things that I do. But I'll protect your property, and I guarantee you nobody will take it. The Pure Trust Organization is the answer to the question of how to preserve property rights in today's highly political environment. What is a Pure Trust Organization? The legal definition of a pure of a trust is a right of property, real or personal, held by one party for the benefit of another. A trust involves three elements, a trustee, a beneficiary, and property held by the trustee for the beneficiary. So you say, well, if I don't own it, how can I still live there and do what I want to do? Very simply, I write up a lease agreement, and you sign that lease agreement, you take that lease agreement home, if any agency shows up, let's say a health, a health inspector, a building inspector, anybody, number one, I, want, I, I encourage you to post that property and uh, no trespassing with the laws and so forth on it. Some of you have seen the signs that I have that, you know, they're good sturdy aluminum signs. They're very durable in the weather. They don't, the sun doesn't bleach them out and all this I stuff. Have one window there. Yeah. And, and uh, I encourage you to put those on there. When they come on your property, do not talk to them. Here's what I want you to do. Ask them, do you have an oath of office with you? Now, right there, stung them because they don't have it. Okay, then I want you to tell them you're under arrest. You have the right to remain silent. You have a right to an attorney. If you can't afford one, one will be appointed for you. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. Do you understand what I just said to you? Now I'm going to call the sheriff to come pick you up. They'll run. They will run. I had one in Florida. The property tax assessor sent some guy out. I placed him under arrest. He's a black guy. He turned white. <laughs> I never seen the beat. And, and he kept saying, am I free to go? Am I free to go? I says, no, you're not free to go. And I finally I did let him go, providing that he would go back and tell the tax assessor, which is an attorney, <coughs> that I want him to come out and do that job. Well, we know he's not going to do it because the federal law and everything is right there on those signs. The interest to your property has one of those signs. You should have one. And it, it sets forth the law, the federal law, and they just violated it. So now they're a defiant trespasser. It doesn't matter if they've seen it or not. I arrested a state cop right down here in, in, in uh, uh, Penn Township on my property for coming on my property. And that's what he said to me. Typically what you would say, I didn't see the sign. I told him, I don't care if you saw the sign or not. If I'm doing 100 miles an hour down this road right here, and you pull up behind me in a police car, and I tell you I didn't see the speed limit sign, what are you going to do? You could care less if I saw the sign or not. This is about revenue. Well, this isn't about revenue. This is about freedom. You're under arrest, and you do have the right to remain silent. I went on through this with you. But anyhow, there are two fundamental categories of trust. A statutory trust, which gets its existence from the legislature and is subject to their jurisdiction and a non-statutory or common law which gets its existence from God-given, an alienable right to contract and is not subject to any intrusion, regulation, or government control. So government putting taxes on it? Excuse me? Where do you get that authority at? They don't have it. <coughs> if the IRS comes after you, your property is no longer susceptible to them taking it. They don't want to come after you unless you have a bank account, you have property, or something they can take. It's not worth their time. Okay. Americans have the unlimited freedom to hold, transfer, sell, give away, or dispose of their property in any manner they wish. Pure trust organizations provide a lawful method of relinquishing ownership, along with its interest, liabilities, while maintaining unlimited use and practical control of the property. If you get taken to court, the only thing the judge wants to know is who has legal control of the property. If you don't have legal control, they'll dismiss the case. Right there. And you don't go and say nothing. The judge will ask you, do you have legal control of the property? Your answer should be and must be no. If you say yes, you're in trouble. They're going to take it. Because you opened the trust <coughs> statutory regulation if you answer in the permit. Many Americans transfer their assets to a pure trust organization in order to preserve their property and estates from the control of the United States federal government and the Internal Revenue Service 
A pure trust organization is defined in the Internal Revenue Code as a foreign trust at 26 U.S.C. 7701A sub 31. I have copies of that. Believe me, it's there. And is not subject to reporting requirements, tax withholding, or the Internal Revenue Code statutes or sections. <coughs> pure trust organizations have been in existence since the early colonial years of this nation. Patrick Henry wrote the first in this country around 1776 for Governor Morris from Virginia. Morris was one of the signers of the Constitution for the United States and financier of the Revolutionary War. It is believed that Plato had a pure trust organization around 400 BC. That trust operated for over 200 years under the name of the North American Land Company. That's in some of the history books. Most wealthy people establish pure trust organizations to protect their assets. These people include the Kennedys, Morgans, Rockefellers, to just name a few. When Mary Jo Kopechny's family and Senator Kennedy uh, sued Senator Kennedy for the death of their daughter, they received a settlement of $30,000, a mere drop in the bucket for the Kennedys. <coughs> the main reason they received such a relatively small settlement is that the assets were already in pure trust organization. Senator Ted Kennedy owned nothing and had sworn an oath of poverty. Therefore, the Kopechnys were unable to collect damages from him. The $30,000 that they got paid came from the auto insurance company. Didn't come from him. He didn't pay a dime. A pure trust organization is sometimes referred to as a, pure, as a true trust, pure trust, unincorporated business organization, or UBO. I do not use that terminology because of statutory connotations. Many people say, they look at what I'm doing, they say, oh, that's a UBO. No, it's not a UBO. I mean, I just set them straight immediately. It's not a UBO. Government has no authority here. Statutes do not apply to this trust. Why a PTO protects property rights? There is a basic precept in law. Ownership carries liability. If you don't own nothing, you have no liability. When you put a thing of value into the PTO, the only liability which the PTO is obligated for is the assets within the PTO. However, the fiduciary owner, the protector, nor the beneficiary is not liable for the obligations of the PTO and is not liable for the obligations of the former. By properly using a PTO, you can virtually eliminate all liabilities from yourself. If you distribute your property into several trusts, then each trust has separate <coughs> and minimal liability. If you own nothing, you carry no personal liability. So if someone sues you, I heard a story today about someone falling and hitting their head on something and the guy sued them. Well, if your property was in a trust, you would have no liability. Only the trust would have the liability. So you don't tell him nothing. Let him sue you. What do you care? You just walk in and claim indigence. I own nothing. And can he sue the trust later? How's he going to know about it unless you tell him? You see, they can find out with research in the records, but I have a remedy for that also. Okay? So if that happens, you know, if I do your trust and that happens, I have the remedy <coughs> for that and I will do that prior to that happening. How it works. Placing property into a PTO is simple. PTOs are not subject to government regulations. When any kind of property, tangible, intangible, real, personal, or in the PTO, it is done by exchange. The transfer is not a sale, gift, donation, or investment. The current owner of the property, known as the exchanger, releases the property to the body of the trust, known as the trust corpus. He receives back the initial assets of the trust consisting of 100 units of beneficial interest in the trust. The initial transfer of the property takes place through schedules A and or B and is for land and real property. Once the appropriate schedules is signed and sealed, the exchange is complete. The right thumbprint is your common law seal. It should be applied with non-opaque ink, blue, red, or green, and so forth. I recommend red or green. There was a time in my life, some of you, I doubt if anybody's as old as me, but some of you might remember when you signed something, you did use your thumbprint. That was your common law seal. 
since 1946, the year that I was born, lawyers claim to have abolished that, but it's not true. They can't abolish common law. Common law is, is, is a, a, an immutable thing. It can't be destroyed. It is here forever. Where did it start from? God. The Bible is the first rule of common law. Right. The exchanger goes from, uh, goes from a property owner to <coughs> holder of beneficial interest in the trust. He no longer owns the property. <coughs> he can only benefit from it. He is, no longer the ex uh, he is no longer the exchanger because the exchange has already been made. He is now the holder of beneficial interest. He may request that some or all of his units of beneficial interest be transferred to another property. Do you have any water? Sure. Because he, he no longer owns the property, the holder has no personal liability for any damage it may cause. No ownership, no liability. They're properly done. And the holder can enjoy full use of the PTO's property without carrying personal liability. It is very important that you comprehend that once properly property is exchanged into a trust, it belongs to that trust. It is not your property any longer. This is why you don't go say my property and so forth. You know, you avoid that kind of that kind of talk. This this property, that property. Right? Yes, this yes, property. That kind of language. But you try to avoid, you know, make your conversations about the property as minimal as possible. When somebody brings up, say, I don't want to talk about it. Well, you live here, don't you? And these people might uh, you know, government officials might bring that information to forefront. Just ask yourself this question. Why do I want to talk to them? I have no liability for this. I'm not going to talk to them. I'll tell them to get out of my face. You know, let, me see your, let me see your oath of office. You know, you're, you're harassing me. You can bring harassment charges against them for it. Once you tell them you don't own it, that's <coughs> all you need to say. Nothing more. Uh, a knowledgeable fiduciary owner will make sure that you have signed the necessary agreements with your trust pertaining to the use of its property. Your identity then is kept clearly and legally separate from that of the trust. The trust hires a, a manager who is called the fiduciary owner. <coughs> the first fiduciary owner may appoint additional fiduciary owners. The Board of Fiduciary Owners has full legal authority over the property held in the trust. So if you hired me to write the trust for you, and you wanted more than one person as fiduciary owner to make decisions, you can do that. All you got to do is tell me, and tell me who you'd like as a fiduciary owner. But my recommendation to you will always be, make sure that you have someone knowledgeable enough to defend the property. It could, it could be lost through liability of the trust if you don't have someone who's knowledgeable enough to defend it. So it's a, it's a high risk thing if you don't have someone knowledgeable. Make sure they are. The, and, and I hope in the rest of the time that I have left on this earth to teach several people how to be a fiduciary owner and how to write and protect trusts. Some of you who have airplanes might want to put your airplane in a trust. It will take away liability from you. It will protect your other property. I have other friends with airplanes. I'm telling them the same thing. The trust appoints a protector whose sole function is to protect the interest of the holders of beneficial interest in the trust. The protector can instruct or request that the trust take certain actions on behalf of the holder. If the trust fails to make such, uh, uh, take such action within a reasonable time period, then the protector has the authority to fire the fiduciary, first fiduciary owner and hire a replacement. Now, your protector should be, doesn't necessarily have to have a whole lot of knowledge, but should have good sense to look at things and know if somebody that you chose as a, a fiduciary owner is not trustworthy, maybe is taking something for themselves. A fiduciary owner can take nothing from the trust, absolutely nothing, except that which he is contracted with you for. Okay? So if he said to you, I will charge $450 a year to administrate your trust. Okay? And you're paying him that. He cannot take one more cent. That's it. So the contract that you sign with the fiduciary owner or the creator of the trust, the creator doesn't have to be the fiduciary owner. I could create the trust for you 
and you could hire Mike here as the <coughs> as the fiduciary owner. And then your protector could watch what Mike does, and if he's doing something he's not supposed to, he can fire him. He can he can request that he fix it, straighten it out, pay it back, whatever. He can even bring criminal charges against him after after firing him for the criminal charge, because he can't do it. There's a lot of protections in here, because that's the biggest question that I get from people is, well, how do I protect my property? How do I know you're not going to steal my property if you have full control of my assets? Because it's done by contractual agreement, you have the protector, you need to be watchful of things. You are anyway. You, know, you watch the government steal it from you. <laughs> the, principle in the, the principles in a PTO are creator, fiduciary owner, and protector. They cannot be related to the exchanger, you. For this, uh, for this would give him legal control of the property and thereby defeat the protections for which the trust was created in the first place. <coughs> so, if you have a real good friend you've known your whole life, you trust them fluently, I recommend that's who you use as a protector if they'll do it. The protector has no control over anything except to watch the fiduciary owners. The key to comprehending whether a, a particular PTO will successfully protect its property from attack revolves around the issue of legal control. The former owner of the property must divest himself of legal control. If the trust claim to the property is ever challenged, or if the state ever tries to dissolve the trust protections, in order to attach liability to an individual, the only thing the court will want to know is who has legal control. Anything else is irrelevant. A PTO that has properly addressed this issue will never have a problem establishing its claims. So, here again, as I said before, you go into court because you're being sued, because someone got hurt on that property. You just go and say, say to the judge, I don't know. It's over. Case dismissed. It's not his fault they filed it wrong. It's not his fault they don't know the necessary information. A trust can hire people by private contract to work for it. Each worker must sign a contract in order to exchange labor for compensation. All workers are private contractors. A PTO cannot offer government-sponsored benefits such as Medicare, Social Security, unemployment insurance, and so forth. However, a PTO can purchase private insurance in order to offer benefits to its workers, if you want to. You don't have to. In your contract, you have an indemnity, indemnity clause to prevent them from suing you, and they'll sign it before you let them go to work. The workings of the PTO are specified in greater detail in the trust indenture. The exchanger. The exchanger is the party who starts out with the property to be placed into the trust. The exchanger is also named because the property in question is neither given nor sold to the trust. It is exchanged. The exchanger is the party of the first part in the original trust contract known as the indenture. Now, if you look at when you purchase property now, a lawyer now writes right in the beginning this indenture. They don't say this deed anymore. They say this indenture. Look up the word indenture in the dictionary and learn well what it means. It's a contract. Someone else has an interest in your property besides you. So who is that someone else? I, subject, I submit to you that someone else is the county tax assessor. This is where they're getting it, through wor uh, crafty words. Okay? <coughs> Madison called it designing men with words of art. When first created a pure trust organization, contains 100 units of beneficial interest. In order to fully implement the protections provided by a peer trust organization, the exchanger trades property for beneficial interest in the PTO. <coughs> I'm going to cut to the chase on some of this stuff here because it's getting long and may be boring to you because you don't you're not familiar much with it. But um, if you If you want to know what happens with a trust, typically a trust signs up for 25 years. You can make it for whatever term you want. But if the trust signs up for 25 years, it will expire in 25 years. If you don't request it to be dissolved and the assets that you have in the trust disseminated 
among the unit holders of interest. And, and remember, the exchanger goes from exchanger to holder of beneficial interest. You don't, you don't have interest in, you have beneficial interest in. It's different than the stock market. Totally different. So, uh, let's say that you want to dissolve the trust. So, if I was your fiduciary owner, you would have the protector send me a note that you want to dissolve the trust because you want to borrow money against the property. Okay, but you lose all your protections. If you do that, that's not a problem. I will dissolve the trust for you. And I will reissue the property back to you as your fiduciary officer. You need someone who knows this stuff and knows how to do it. Okay, so in doing this, uh, you don't lose your property. And any time you feel that you want to dissolve that trust, you can do it. You can do it by request. It has to go in the minutes. This is an organization that is done totally by the book. There's minutes of everything that happens. If you send me a letter, I'm going to write a minute and put it right into the trust book with the letter attached that I, uh, did or rejected what you asked. I will tell you this. If I'm your fiduciary officer and you say, Hagen, I'd like to use that property for collateral against a loan from my friend over here. But I don't want to take it out of trust. I'm going to tell you no. I'm going to tell you no because it's my duty to protect your interest as the holder of the beneficial interest. If I believe that it's contrary to your interest, I, I am duty bound to tell you no. And I will. So this is one of the things you may not like. But then again, you might find that it protects you from yourself even. Okay, so I mean there might be a time when you're in, in some kind of a situation where you feel pressured to do that sort of thing. I'm not pressured. No matter how much pressure you do to me, it's my responsibility to protect you. And I'll do that. And a good fiduciary officer will. Could I sell some of my units of beneficial interest? No. You have to do a request through your protector to me and I will decide whether or not it's in your interest to do it. I have full control. I can say no. I'm not going to I'm not going to do it. If you want to transfer not sell. If you want to exchange some of your beneficial interest to someone else, you send a note or a letter to me the fiduciary officer. And I will make the decision and I'll put it in the minutes as to what my decision was. Okay? If I approve that, then you will have to sign a new agreement, and that agreement will exchange some of those uh, yes. units to the other person. You can also delegate units to other members of your family and so forth. Okay, But it, everything's done by minute, and it's done by approval <coughs> for your best interest. So if... Uh, there's a lot of different protections that I, I won't go into because there's too many of them. And if you have a question, like I said, my number and so forth is here. If you have a question that comes up, just write it down and call me and I'll answer it. Uh, you could talk to your husband and wife here. So <laughs> each has 50 units? You could, yes. yes. For the Creator, I want to read this to you because this is important. I said before, I can create the trust for you, and someone else can be the fiduciary officer. It doesn't mean that I have to be the fiduciary officer because I created the trust. It's a contract. You contract me to create it. You also contract me to be the fiduciary officer if you want to. That's who you want to be, or whoever you want to be. It has to be done by contract. Well, as the creator, once I'm done creating the trust, it's over. Our contract's over. The new contract with whomever, me or whoever, then takes Takes, uh, takes, hold, takes place. The creator is an independent party not related to the exchanger. The creator is a party of the second part in the original trust indenture. This ensures that legal control is divested properly. The creator appoints the first fiduciary owner. So you've got to tell me when I create the trust who you want to be the fiduciary owner. And I put that in the body of the trust. The creator carries no personal liability with respect to the official actions except for acts of intentional fraud or negligence. The, creator pro pro the creator's property cannot be attached for a grievance or claim against the trust. 
The reverse is also true. A PTO carries no liability for the activities of the Creator, nor directly connected with official duties. Trust property cannot be attached to satisfy a claim or grievance against the Creator or his or her individual capacity. Upon, cer uh, upon certain rare circumstances, the Creator may be needed at some point in the future. For example, should the Board of Fiduciary Owners become vacant, then the Creator would be needed to appoint a new fiduciary <coughs> officer. So let's say somebody said, I just quit. I'm not going to be the fiduciary owner no more, and I'm not writing a letter, I'm not doing nothing. But I'm not doing it anymore. I'm done. At that point, you need to notify the Creator, and the Creator, and you do that through your protector, the Creator will solicit or decide through consultation who the new fiduciary officer will be. But there has to be a fiduciary officer. If, <clears throat> let's say you piss me off, and I don't want to be your, your fiduciary officer anymore. I can't, I won't, because of my responsibility, up and quit. I will tell you, I will send you a letter of resignation. But my resignation will be effective upon the, the appointment of a new fiduciary officer. Once that new fiduciary officer is appointed properly, then I'm done. It's over. And it will be by minute. It will be in the minutes. A copy of the letter that I send to you, signed and sealed with my thumbprint, will be the termination of my uh, duties. The protector. I'm going to cover that because that's important for you to know. The first fiduciary owner appoints a protector. The protector is an independent party, not related to the exchange, as I said before, who is charged with the responsibility of ensuring that the Board of Fiduciary Owners always acts in the best interest of the holders of beneficial interest. If the protector believes that the first fiduciary <coughs> officer is acting in a manner uh, inimical or unfavorable to the holders of beneficial interest, he or she has the authority to discharge the first fiduciary officer and install a new fiduciary officer. Here again. Done by minute, it has to be. The protector may request that the trust take certain actions such as buy, sell, or otherwise transfer property and so forth. The protector cannot force the trust to do anything, but may take the first fiduciary owner's refusal as an indicator in making an evaluation as to his uh, viability uh, in that position. The protector, the protector may not discharge the fiduciary owners if the board consists of more than one. In such an event, the uh, other fiduciary owners may convene to consider such a request from the protector concerning the complaints about one or more of their number. However, in these circumstances, it is the other board member who must determine the fate of their colleagues. The protector only holds direct authority over the board so long as it consists of only one fiduciary owner. Now, Something that I didn't tell you, and I didn't read here, and it may be in here in the writing, I, I don't know because I wrote this from what I learned and so forth, but I will tell you this. If the protector, let's say I'm the fiduciary owner, and a protector sends me a letter firing me, I can challenge his firing me if I believe it's not for good cause. I can say, excuse me. You don't just fire me. You need to tell me why, and it has to be a good reason. If I've done nothing wrong, I'm going to refuse. If if you know that I've done something wrong, well, certainly I would know that. I'm not going to. I'm not going to bother. I'll just go ahead and resign. I'll just go ahead and. I mean, I'm fired. Period. I, I'm not resigning. I'm fired. But if I didn't do anything wrong, and he thinks I did, I'm going to challenge it. And, and should, because if, if I'm not taking anything that I didn't contract with you to take, I haven't done any wrong, and I did act in your best interest. A PTO can hire a number of workers. Like officers, each worker signs a contract with a trust to perform the services in exchange for compensation. No taxes are withheld by the trust. No government-sponsored benefits are provided by the trust. Though private benefit holders of beneficial... Well, that's not right. uh, though uh, private programs may be offered, things like Blue Cross, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, and such, each worker is responsible for any taxes that he or she might owe. 
you don't pay the taxes because that opens the trust to beneficial or to statutory rule. You don't want to do that. But if you want to provide benefits, uh, medical and that sort of thing, if you want to, it's not mandatory. For workers, you can do that. Um, typically, most people like myself are indigent and can't afford that kind of thing anyway, so we don't worry about it. But those people, I do have some people that are very wealthy that I'm doing trust for and has multiple trusts that are providing insurance for workers. So that's a good thing. Holders of beneficial interest certificates. Now, I probably should have brought a copy of a trust to show you tonight, but I cannot divulge information that I do for you to anyone, and I won't. I could print some things out such as a certificate of a holder of beneficial interest with the 100 units and show you that this is what you receive showing. It's a certificate showing that you are the holder of that number of certificates. So, uh, but I, I will never divulge any information on your trust to anyone. I am duty bound to do that and I will do it. I will never reveal that information to anyone. I will not show your trust to anyone. I will not do any of those things except the protector. I will keep that trust in my possession. I will give you a copy of it. I recommend you never show it to anyone because then you let them know. I have a client who has property and the property is in his name alone. I did his trust. Then he came and wanted me to show it to his wife. I said, no. I'm not going to do that. I don't think it's in your interest to do that. Well, then I'll show her mine. I says, hey, you do what you want to do. You know, but if you open the statutory uh, rule, I'm telling you right now, it ain't very smart. And I will resign. He showed it to her. She didn't have a problem with it. I thought he was going to have a problem. I thought maybe she had coerced him to do it, but she hadn't. He just wanted to show it to her. Oh, well. <laughs> if a problem arises, I will resign because he did that. I don't, I don't want anybody that I do a trust for to go and show it to someone else. Keep it private. Keep it where it belongs. Because then they'll go start and say, well, you know what? He don't have to pay taxes. He went over and created a trust. He don't pay no taxes. Why do you want to bring that kind of grief on yourself for him? You know what, what these government officials are going to do. I mean, you just open Pandora's box. <coughs> Obtaining a mailing location for the trust. This is important also. The mailing location should not be, let me rephrase that. The mailing location for the trust should not be where you live. It should not be at the property. I recommend a private mailing location, not a post office, not a post office box, because that opens to statutory rule. But a private mailing facility where you can receive mail and pick it up occasionally. And you have someone who owns that and leases it to you. And that your mail be received there. The mail coming to the <coughs> trust, I as a fiduciary owner, <coughs> am establishing that sort of thing that can be done whenever something happens pertaining to the trust, I let you know about it. Any mail or anything that comes, I deal with it appropriately. That's why I'm the administrator. A fiduciary officer. I call it both administrator or fiduciary officer. <laughs> fiduciary officer is the proper name. But I let you know what's going on. What is private, you keep it private. Um, it's my duty as the administrator or the fiduciary officer to handle those things, including property taxes. Um, about this mailing location in here when you read this CRMA. That's the Commercial Mail Receiving Agency. That's not the post office. And that's what I'm talking about. So when you read this online, which will be on there next week, I think, uh, you will see what I'm talking about. <coughs> Moving property in and out of trust. That will be on there. I'm not going to get into it. I want you to read it for yourself. It will answer the questions that you may have on it. If it doesn't, here again, you'll have my phone number, my contact information. Give me a call and I'll talk to you about it. Vehicles in trust goes in Schedule B. Property, house, land, so forth, those are Schedule A. Uh, those are explained in here. Again, I encourage you to read that. Read it thoroughly. Any questions, give me a call. 
Opening a bank account. Before 9-11, you could open a bank account for a trust using Form 8 uh, WBEN or W8BEN. The banks will no longer do that. So now they've shut the trust out of banking. So what you do now is use an LLC uh, from a foreign corporation and a contract with the LLC to pay money out, to receive money in, so the trust can actually do all these money-making things and everything. They always could. It just gets contracted out with someone. They pay the bills. They receive money in. They're under contract just like fiduciary officer would be. But the trust never has to handle cash. Is that, L that LLC, that's an added expense, right? Well, sure it is. But how much do you actually save by getting away from government control is the question. You know, and how much do you have to tolerate? Because here, the LLC doesn't divulge anything. They're like the fiduciary officer. They, they divulge nothing. They don't have to. And there's no taxes. There's absolutely no taxes on any of it. It's not taxable. So if you said, if you, if the, if the, let's say the trust, let me explain that. Let's say you made me the fiduciary officer. And you and I talked and, and we decided, which will be my decision ultimately, that we're going to sell the property through the trust and you don't want to pay taxes. I'll sell it. And I'll put the money through, however you tell me, through the LLC and there's not one cent in taxes. And what about, um, let's call it control or enforcement, like that sign right there. I live on, let's say I live on my property. My, what was my property? Yes, the property. The property. The property. The property. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't have any right to enforce that anymore because it's not my land to enforce. No, no. You, you do. You're the manager. Remember, there's a contract. You're the manager of the property. You do have the authority to enforce it. You absolutely do. And should. Okay, again, in terminating the trust, the trust, I pretty much already went over that stuff. Uh, additional support services, I'm going to be doing, like I said, the common law liens, uh, property tax elimination, quite a number of things that I'm going to be doing uh, as services further beyond this. I probably will be continuing to uh, put on the website more and more services that I'm going to do. Um, most of the money that I take in, I need very little to live on for myself, but most of the money that I do take in, I use and I have used in the past for educational purposes. I buy books, I give books to people who can't afford it, and I really can't afford to do that, but this is how I do it. By charging money for things more than it actually costs me, I do these. I can tell you this, to create a trust, for me to sit down and write a trust and do it properly, takes me at least three days. I charge $1,800 to do a trust. I charge $500 to do a common law uh, lien. But I go to the courthouse with you. I do all these things. I devote a lot of time to this. So it's not like I sit down with a template and in 10 minutes I've got it done. It don't happen that way. If I did, I would be. it would be a disservice to you. It takes me a lot of time to do these things I do them, I make sure they're right, I make sure they're done properly, I go with you to the courthouse, or I'll go to the courthouse myself. Once it's notarized, once everything's done and notarized, with the common law seal on it, I don't need you and you don't need me. Anybody can go, I can send a runner in there to record that. The recorder of deeds in Pennsylvania here, it would be the court clerk in Florida, takes that document, they run it through, stamp it, they put their stickers and everything on it. They give me back a copy. Then they mail me the original with everything, all the stickers and everything on it. They mail the fiduciary officer that information. And the information is on there. We're going to send it to. So now it is done. It's a done deal. You no longer have any liability whatsoever. Period. So now if you have any questions about these things that I've covered, uh, I will do my best to answer them for you. But I want to point out some things here. I, I obviously didn't print enough of these, but I printed some uh, contact information, which will, all, will also be on the website, of my phone number, um, my address in Florida. I did not put my email on here, but my email is pretty simple. It's my name, backwards, like in the military. Smith.Hagen, H-A-G-A-N. A lot of people are doing H-A-G-E-N. It don't work. 
It has to be A N H A G A N. Smith dot Hagen at mail dot com. It's real simple. So you can email me, and sometimes I go two days without looking at emails, but most of the time I do it every day. But I will respond to your emails, and I will, if I need to, I'll call you if you give me the information to do it with. So that's here. If you decide you want to do a trust, <clears throat> I have here the trust consultation request. You fill this out, sign it, date it, and send it to me. Or bring it to me, in this case, if you want. Uh, I'll need all this information, and there may be a few other things, uh, is one of the reasons why I need your contact information that I might need in doing the trust for you. And this explains all of that. I have, I have here also, for um, anyone who wants to join with the Freeman Society and learn and do as I do, that I, I encourage you to sign up here. Uh, I did not put a pledge amount on here. You can pledge whatever you want, $10 or exceeding it. $10 is what we did in the, in the amount to, uh, for the, for the uh, Freeman Society. But Freeman Society, remember, is different than what I do in these trusts. The Freeman Society is to hold government officers responsible, accountable, and culpable. And we are doing that. There, there's an illegally elected sheriff in the county that I live in, Marion County, Florida. We're after that. The, what happened was, I'll explain that so that you, if you ever see this happen, you'll know what, what took place. There was a Republican, there was two Republican candidates in the primaries for sheriff of Marion County. There was no Democrat. There was a Constitutional Party candidate. Uh, the sheriff who, uh, the deputy sheriff who won the primary to run for sheriff on the Republican Party got caught in a scandal and resigned a few days before the November election. His, the Republican Party decided, <clears throat> and we looked into what they did, that they're going to put the other candidate that lost the primary up and the votes that go for Mr. Coon, who was the one who resigned, would go to Mr. Blair, who was the loser. <laughs> so I thought, that's not constitutional. His name wasn't on the ballot. They, there's people that voted, believed they were voting for Coon and didn't vote for him. He lost in the primary, so I'm sure those same people, would they have voted for a Republican? Maybe. They might have voted for the Constitution Party member. He got 27% of the vote. And, and, and so I went over to the election bureau and I said, hey, I want to know how you did this. Well, why? I said, it doesn't matter why. I have the right to know that. I live here. Well, she said, I'll be right back. She went back in the back. They always do. She came back in, and she had these papers. And I looked at the one, and it had a lawyer's name on it, uh, the chief counselor for the uh, State Department of Florida. And I said, well, what I'm reading here, she made the decision on what for you guys to do. She don't have that authority. She's an attorney. Well, that's the way she read the statute. I said, good, give me a copy of the statute. She did. She went and got me a copy, brought it back, I read it. I said, that ain't what the statute says. The statute doesn't say what she told you to do. That sheriff is in office illegally. He cannot hold his office. He is a non-officer right now. At best, he may be a deputy. A few days after that, it came out that he misspent campaign funds. So now he's got a scandal. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, we're, we're fighting this battle, and this is how I do it, by being a member. And hopefully you'll do the same kind of things here. Sheriff Sloop here in Butler County needs his feet held to the fire. I'm going to tell you something, he's a phony. I tried every way I could to support that man. And I found him every time to be a phony. Jim Boy, you were with us one day when he tried to belittle me with his remarks, remember? At the restaurant. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, he, that's his way around things. When, when he's caught, he wants to make a joke out of it. It's not a joke to me. You know, a lot of people know him, a lot of people like him. A lot of people vote for him because he's a Republican. I will only vote for anyone 
because they're a constitutionalist and they believe in a proper form of government. I won't vote for anybody for any other reason. The party is not enough for me to vote for them. I hope you do the same thing. I hope you remember that when you're casting a vote. But you're not going to find any candidates on the ballot today, right now, that know the Constitution well enough. They need to know the Constitution as well as I do, and I can quote it. And I guarantee you there's not one that can do it. They're in it for the money. James Madison made it very clear. Take the profit out of government, and only statesmen will seek those offices. And the laws that they make, they, will, they know they will live under them when they come out of office. Well, what is Congress doing today? What are the state legislatures doing? They're exempting themselves. Obamacare, Congress is exempt for it. They not only made themselves exempt from it, they also made their aides exempt from it. Didn't that get changed? No. I thought it did. But, you know, they don't have the power to do those things. You know, we should not be giving them retirements. We should only give them benefits while they're in office. When they're out, they're done. Nothing. You get nothing more. That's what Madison was talking about. Well, we've allowed these people even to set their own pay scale. <laughs> yeah. They're not supposed to do that. The police. The police are not supposed to make their rules. We are supposed to make them. But they do whatever they want. With that, I'll wrap it up. I'll leave it open if you want to ask any questions. And then we'll move on. To take out a common law lien, you have to have a common law trust or not? No. No, you do not. I'll have to learn more about that. Okay. Why do these attorneys say there is no common law? And why did all they don't want you to use it. If they lie to you, right. if they tell you something don't exist, you're not likely to try to use it. Do they, you, because of you know, the, uh, that slave thing, is that why they think that maybe that you don't have any rights under common law because you're no longer Well, you're only a debt slave by, slave by statute and by the so-called 16th Amendment. But I encourage you to look up the Supreme Court cases on the 16th Amendment. In the Bruce Haber case, the court, the high court said this, and they can't interpret the Constitution. They can only interpret the act or the, or the statute if it's consistent with the Constitution, but they can't interpret the Constitution to make it the other way around. But the Bruce Haber case, the court said, the 16th Amendment created no new taxes. So if they didn't have the tax before, they don't have it now. No new powers of taxation exactly. on the people. Exactly. Yeah. And, and the so, began. but people don't see it. They don't, they never read cases, and they, they don't know how to read them. Even lawyers, the lawyers will sit there, even if they do know it, they'll lie to you. They won't tell you the truth about it. And in the Pollock versus Farmers Loan Association, they said the same thing. They said, all income taxes are taxes on your labor. Article 1, Section 9, Clause 4 prohibits uh, taxing the people directly. It's a direct tax. Article 1, Section 9, Clause 4 says, no capitation or other direct tax shall be laid except according to the census hearing before directed to be taken. Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3 makes it very clear that taxes can only be equal apportioned among the people in the states. So if the bill for Pennsylvania is a million dollars and they have a million people, they can charge one dollar to each person. It doesn't matter how much you earn or how much you have. One dollar to each person and that's it. That's equal apportionment among the states. The states gets billed for the million, they build their citizens. That's the purpose of the census. The census is not for all the stuff that they have on them. And I encourage you never to answer anything except how many people are at that place for that census report. If you have, if you have yourself, your wife, and four kids, you've got six people. Put down six, and that's all you need to do. Do nothing else. If they say, well, we'll come out and interview, and I'll arrest you for trespassing if you do. And when they come there, put them under arrest. Don't be afraid of it. And you, then you, you still put the fine on them, right, Edgar? Yes. Yeah, you send them a bill. You get their information, you send them a bill. They acted privately. They didn't act officially. They acted privately. And demand their oath of office because they don't have it. Then put criminal prosecution against them. Now, there's one thing I do want to cover that I neglected to cover on this Freeman Society. You're going to see on there, and I wrote the article today, you're going to see on there Council of Censors. 
1776, uh, Benjamin Franklin was smart enough to know that government without some enforcement mechanism would transcend their authority and take away the rights of the people. So they gave us a he gave us a mechanism to fix that. It's called the Council of Censors. It's two people elected in every municipality and every county in the state for the purposes of oversight, watching these people and seeing that they don't transcend their powers. And if you, you can pull it up, type in to a Google search, Council of Censors, Pennsylvania Constitution, 1776, and read section 47 of that document. We are setting forth an endeavor in Florida right now to put that on the ballot and get it done and then hold an election to elect two, two people in every city, town, municipality, and county for that purpose. There's people right here in Pennsylvania that are clamoring for me to get it going here. I would like to see us reinstate that here. You want to know what happened to it? The Council of Censors met and only they could call a constitutional convention to amend the Constitution, not the legislature. So they called a, con they called a convention because the legislature wanted them to in 1783 and convened and, and, and uh, uh, adjourned in 1784. And they said, no, the Constitution is fine, does not need any amendments. The legislature didn't like that, so they wrote a new Constitution in 1789 and began to use it in 1790 without the authority to do so, and they admitted it. So that ended the Council of Censors by the new constitution that they wrote. So we can, the power belongs to us. Even in that new constitution, Article 1, Section 2 says, all power is inherent in the people, and all free governments are founded on their authority. For the advancement of these ends, they have at all times an inalienable and indefeasible right to reform, alter, or abolish their government and institute new government laying its foundation on principles most likely to achieve those ends. We can do this. That's why I would like to see you guys right here, you meet regular, you do all these different meetings and stuff. If you don't hold government accountable, the Greening House will never take effect. Nothing will ever take effect because they're always <coughs> going to be in control. You, you are and will remain their slave. But if you take back the authority and you hold one of these people responsible, accountable, and culpable for what they did, the rest will go away. Not one of them wants to be subjected to that. If you get that accomplished, and I, I guarantee you it's an arduous process, but stick to it and do it. Don't try to do it all in one day. Don't think you're going to do it all in one day. Begin the path of creating such a thing. Begin the path of getting the necessary signatures to get it on the ballot. Go to the election office over here, tell them what you want to do, Tell them, don't tell them what you're doing, just tell them you want to get an initiative on the ballot. What do I need to do? And they'll tell you. And that's what we're doing in Florida. We already did it in Florida. We have now begun the process to get that initiative on the ballot. Now, if people find out there's not going to be any more property taxes, there's not going to be any more building permits, there's not going to be any of these things that you are having to be burdened with today, they're going to like that. Not all, but there's going to be enough that you'll get enough signatures to get that initiative on the ballot. And I believe that that initiative will pass. So this is this Freedom Society, like I said, Benjamin Franklin referred to us more than 27 times in that original document as free men and women. He never referred to us as subjects, citizens, or anything else. The 1968 Constitution refers to you as a subject. How did you subject yourself to something you didn't authorize them to do? Any more questions? Just about mailing address for the individual, the exchanger. Mm -hmm. Does that matter? Does that need changed? No. No, your mailing address can be the same uh, be, even though you no longer own it. Um, the but the, the fiduciary officer who administrates the trust needs a separate mailing address that could be verified. It shows, it shows contractual agreement <coughs> separate from you, the exchanger, because you're no longer the exchanger. Remember what it said. You're no longer the exchanger. Once the, con once the deal is done, you now are the holder of beneficial interest. Is there a contract in there for me to live on the property? Yes. Absolutely. There's a contract in there that allows you to do whatever you want to do.
but you don't want to subject yourself to statutory rules, so you, uh, there's things you might not want to do, but you wouldn't want to do them anyway. I'll have to study that. I only have one question. Who's going to head up the Freeman Society in Butler County? Mm -hmm. And Allegheny County. Mm -hmm. Him, right? I think Jim Barr would be good for Allegheny. I'll handle Allegheny. All right, Mr. Speaker, I nominate Gary V. for. Uh, Let me make a recommendation on what to do about that. Okay. Since you're willing to be the chairman, act as a chairman at this point, and I'll delegate you as a chairman. I'm the national chairman at this point. Hold a meeting and call people in. Explain to them, and if you need help, I'll help you, especially while I'm here. Right? Uh, explain to them what what it is, what it's about, and what it does. Now, a lot of that's going to be on the website soon. We get that up, so they'll be able to go on there and look too. And it'll gain a lot of uh, a lot of confidence from the people too in seeing that. Get people to join and get at least let's say a dozen members. Hold a meeting and, and nominate and elect officers, the chairman, the vice chairman, the secretary. You need, you need and, and the treasurer. You need dependable people. Right. People that will be there, people that will keep records. Uh, now, we meet once a month? We, yes, you meet, actually there's two meetings a month. There's, oh. You're going to need an executive committee. Okay. Those who will, the, the executive committee should be at least four people. But the duties of the executive board is to handle things in between monthly meetings that the chairman of the general body uh, doesn't handle. But the chairman of the general body can and must be a <coughs> member of the executive committee. Okay, doesn't have to be the chairman, just a member. Okay, uh, but encourage people to join it and to uh, donate if they can as well as pay dues, mm -hmm. so that there's money there to do things with. Okay, I'll get with you. Okay. Now, Allegheny, yeah, it's Allegheny County, so Jim would be a good vice chair. <laughs> Jim's always there. What about Butler County now? We need some Butler County people. Got to get enough members, huh? Oh, there you are. <clears throat> uh, come I on, Butler County's got the most people here. <coughs> yeah. I'm a there you go, Doug. Yeah. There you go. I was going to suggest Doug? that. Yeah. All right. I'll appoint you then right. as chairman of Butler County. Okay. And then you can do the same thing. You've heard what I said, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And and uh, uh, encourage people who you know that has the money that can afford to do it to give a $100 donation to get it started. It's not bad I did it by donating $100 first in Florida. As soon as I did, four more people donated it. So we, we started right off with a $500 donation. Right. gave us a chance to print shirts. We didn't have a phone number. We didn't have a website. Uh, I had to use my phone number and email, which is all wrong on here now. But they wanted to go ahead and get shirts made up so people would see them. And they are bringing a lot of interest. I don't particularly like this shirt. I like what it says on it, but I don't particularly like the design. But the chairman, that's what the chairman wanted, and that's what prevailed. So I voted against it. But <laughs> I... I don't believe that we, we should put on shirts and that. I don't think we should use the flag as a background for what we're doing. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, if you want to use the Constitution, because the flag doesn't represent the Constitution. It doesn't represent law. It re represents a country. Represents okay. A In some cases, I won't get into that because there's other variables. But I recommend against using the flag <coughs> as part of it. But use it because what we are about and what you'll see on the website. Now you can create your own. Jim, you know in the Constitution Party how we did this county chapters and dividing the state up into regions so the, the state could actually have regional meetings. We, we divided it up into six regions, Pennsylvania, for Constitution Party so that we had, a, it never did work out because people were, you have, you have too many people that are, are, I'll just call it selfish. Mm -hmm. You know, they have their own agenda. Rather than pick a thing that you want to do and you want to support and stick into that and leave your selfishness out of it. Because that's what causes these conflicts. You know, we, we uh, I guess most of you know or some of you know, I was one of the Pennsylvania delegates to the 
Second Continental Congress in St. Charles, Illinois. And I went there only for the purpose of hopingly being able to offer information to keep us on track and not lose focus on the Constitution as it is, or as it was created. Um, I found that I there was a there? lot more yeah. knowledgeable people there, okay. some far more knowledgeable than myself on the Constitution. And, and it, was, it was a proud thing for me to be among people like that. There were some there who had their own horn to toot on something. And, and they, they led things differently. I spoke twice. One time I spoke, I spoke about the reason why we were there. Uh, the second time I spoke, I spoke about the life issue. Because life is a three-legged stool. Life, freedom, and property. You cut a leg off the three-legged stool, it falls, doesn't it? Well, they tabled the life issue. They wanted the life issue left because it was too controversial. Some people believed in abortion, some didn't. So they wanted to table it. I felt seriously offended about that. And I made that point. It was short and sweet. I didn't speak very much. Some people couldn't get away from the microphone. They couldn't talk enough. But there was actually a lot of contention there. There was actually people who were about ready to fist fight. Several times. Because they had their own agenda. I want good government. I want government put back the way we formed it, a constitutional form. Republican, constitutional Republican form. The Constitution is the written law. Republican form is the law that the Constitution created. But we're the masters of it. We're the ones to enforce it. If we don't enforce it, nobody will. By these things that I'm talking to you about, this is the enforcement. If we can take this country back, this is how we've got to do it. It's a peaceful means. It requires no violence. It's all done by law. And we can do it. But it's going to take a lot of work. It's going to take dedication. Effort. You will not be able to devote your whole time to it because you've got lives to live too. But dedicate some time to it. And do all you can to enforce it, to, to promote it, and get it done. Any other questions? Must be good. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, Sherry, do you want to say anything about what you're doing? Sherry. For Sherry, yeah. Huh? No, she does. Okay, she has some protective weapons. If anybody wants to know yeah. what she's doing down there, go talk to her. And if Tom, if we we'll maybe speak on Bitcoin, and then if for a few minutes, if anybody wants to learn about that, and then we're going to have some music here. If uh, yeah, maybe. anybody Whoa, wants to. Stick around for some music and a drink a beer or two. There's some beer in the fridge. I'm going to pass uh, the basket for the house. Yourself. You hold Here. it up. I grabbed it. I'm just kidding. Yeah. I just you. kneeled in. Thank you, and I appreciate that. Nailed up on the wall. Uh, I haven't heard from him. Okay. Okay. Uh, I want to press him. I want to press him. Thank you. I'll get you just in a minute. Oh, yeah. Okay, Bitcoin is uh, not as intense as what Hagen was talking about. <laughs> it's it's, interesting. it's um, kind of a way to not have to participate in any of that, but I would never do anything whole hog. Um, when I'm investing any kind of money in something, I guess I'll put it that way. Uh, you have to hedge your bets. I've been investing for a really long time. And you really do need to learn how to hedge your bets and diversify. And uh, one of the things that you can diversify into, which will actually help the breeding house, because Mike is using it as almost like a tally stick. Only you can use currency in trade instead of a tally stick for work or products or whatever. Uh, Bitcoin is basically... It's a it's called a cryptocurrency, and it trades on a market just like any other currency. And you can buy it from people with cash or gold or silver, and then you can use it to buy other things. 
uh, like services, goods, and any kind of electronics for sure that you want from the internet. Um, basically, um, it was created by this, uh, this guy, Satoshi Nakamoto, and nobody knows whether that's a real person or uh, a group of people that were hackers. And they wanted to come up with a currency that operated outside of the Federal Reserve System. It's, everybody here knows that the government is corrupt and stealing from us every way they can. And a way to push back actually is to use Bitcoin and to encourage other people to use Bitcoin because the way it works it has nothing to do with the government and taxation. You can buy and sell anything you want. And you are limited to your Im imagination. You have, there's no limit to your, what you can use, you can buy it for, put it that way, including illegal things and stuff. And there's actually places online where you can, but I don't advocate that. So, when I found this stuff, it was probably about, what, three, four months ago, five months ago. I bought it at 37 and it's trading right now at about $125 per Bitcoin. And the, the value goes up and down. I mean, we had, there was a bubble, it went up to like $280, and then it went down to 90 Yeah. I had a guy speak a year and a half ago, a different guy. Yeah. It was $2. It was $2. It started out, it was just pennies, it didn't even have a value, but it's been around for about five years now. And uh, you get one of those little QR codes or uh, an address that people can pay to, and you can also spend from it. You get this, it's like an electronic wallet. And uh, the easiest way, actually, to learn about it is to go to my website, which is myfreemarketincome.com. Or Mike's, which we still don't have. I know. <laughs> anyway, when you go there, WordPress, you can, you can poke around and you can learn. There's like an actual tutorial about Bitcoin. And uh, what I wanted to do is I'll just pack, give everybody a card. It's for free Bitcoin. If you make the effort and you go to my website and you check it out, follow the directions on the card, I'll give you what's called a micropayment. And you can, in doing so, you'll learn, <coughs> you'll learn what it is and how it works and on a real rudimentary scale. Yeah, yeah, 10 cents is what it'll be worth. It could be worth like 50 bucks five years from now, or it could be worth nothing. You know, it's, it's a currency, okay? But if you want to really know, you know, what how Bitcoin is and how it works, the tutorials are on there, and it, it really explains it better than I can. And it talks about the history and everything. Um, but, I don't know, you know about Bitcoin. I already gave you one of these, didn't I? Do you have one of these? No. I'm going to make those for you. And we've got to get your website set up. Did you get the e any email recently? I haven't. I've been so busy. Well, anyway, I'm trying to help Mike use Bitcoin along with or in lieu of tally sticks. Okay, so the currency of choice here, really, even for the donations and everything, would be Bitcoin. And all you have to do is pay it to Mike's wallet. <coughs> you can make donations if you want to. You can do it here, actually, with your, uh, if you have a smartphone. You know, it's a matter of sending an email or taking a picture of the QR code, and that's it. You can just put how much money you want to put in. This, the coverage is really spotty here, and I don't have any way to show you my phone. They actually have applications you can put on your phone so you can transfer it. And uh, there's also local exchanges for Bitcoin. That, um, there's no, I, well, you're closer to Pittsburgh. The people that, that actually have Bitcoin for sale, you can actually go into a coffee shop and you say, hey, well, I want to get some Bitcoin. Another way you can get it is uh, there's a thing called Coinbase and Blockchain, which are uh, websites that I can give you the, uh, the URL to. It's, it's, it's really pretty simple. Actually, I should have that. No. It's blockchain.info. Uh, be a blockchain. Yeah, block and chain. Dot, uh, info is where you can go. You can actually get a wallet there. That also is all explained on the website, My Free Market Income. Um, it's in, there's a tab there that says, uh, uh, get your wallet now, I think, or get Bitcoin now. Um, so, 
I mean, that's really, if there's any questions about it, I think, uh, you know, it's, <coughs> what, what, you know, what would you like to know about Bitcoin that I haven't explained? You know, a little bit that I do know, that you know, it sounded really great, and then somebody come out on one of the talking heads and, and said it wasn't working out, you know, and I can't remember what the specific uh, well, you know, of it. on the... the People say that there are weaknesses to it, but they haven't really. Wait, how strong you know, is that Federal Reserve now? Yeah, it's <laughs> robust enough to have survived. Gotta say, when the Federal Reserve you know, for the last four years, all the way, five that years. Bitcoin's still going to be there because it's not based on it. I mean, I, I could, I could, I, you know, I hesitate because I could give you like five or ten things that people. The Federal Reserve I know is backed by gold and silver. Or yeah, yeah, but it's <laughs> global thermal nuclear war. Yeah, it's backed by your. Yeah, you're just saying, you know, what if the government shuts it down? That's one of them. Well, they'd have to shut down the whole internet. We'll all, inter all commerce is done we over the internet on, on some sort of, of a network. So they can't shut it down. And it's because of the way the encryption key is designed. Okay. The encryption is designed. Uh, it's a peer to peer network. Do you know what a peer to peer network is? Um, it's kind of like a file sharing. Like people will uh, pirate movies and stuff from the web. But you know, that could be done on a local internet basis where I could plug mine into the phone line and, you're, and I can call your computer directly. And we could trade our Bitcoins without going on the internet. Yes, but the blockchain is a universal thing that's shared on a peer to peer network. Okay. So everybody has the entire ledger of all Bitcoin transactions that have been made since the beginning of time. And, and it had each person who has a wallet has a stamp on their wallet, basically, that identifies it as that wallet, not as you. Okay. So whenever you make, like if I give you $10 worth of Bitcoin, mm -hmm. the blockchain that I have, when I, take, when I give that to you, both of our blockchains through the internet, peer to peer, will actually update that information, thus keeping the, the, uh, the whole system uh, in, in a ledger that is verified by the general population. So there's no central control of Bitcoin. And that's the, how it's like a peer to peer networking market. With, like with, um, if you wanted to get. A, Again, I go to the movies because it's the easiest thing to understand. If you go to BitTorrent and you want to get uh, Terminator 2, you can get Terminator 2 from the internet on that distributed network because everybody that's in the network of BitTorrent that has that uh, movie has a completed copy of it and it's verified amongst all of them so that you get the movie in the right order all put together correctly. Think of money when I, with what I just described. So everybody has a copy of the complete ledger with all the uh, transactions that have made have been made in real time. It takes about a minute or so for it to propagate through the network just like anything else. Might be. Sometimes it's instantaneous. It just depends on whether you're doing it on an exchange that's actually exchanging the Bitcoin. But then it has to be verified by the network. And you want as, the more verifications you get, the more you know how sound that transaction is. So it's basically a, it's it's like a bank. Okay, it operates kind of like a bank with checking accounts, except that with a bank, there's one place where they keep track of it all, and they're doing all the money changes. Well, with the blockchain, you actually have that in your blockchain, and you have X amount of blockchain in what's called a wallet. There's like three different kinds of wallets. You can have a wallet that's paper, you can have a wallet that's in your head, or you can have like a wallet with um, blockchain. Okay. It's real transactional, and that's the way it works. It's pretty simple, actually. Once you figure it out, but when you first wrap your head around it, it's really hard to understand. You know, one of the other things people say is, well, there's nothing backing it up. What's backing up the Federal Reserve notes? Nothing. Nothing. What backs up gold and silver? Nothing themselves. They are. There's nothing backing them up. So it acts like a currency that way. It's actually money. You have to think of Bitcoin as money, or in the parlance of the reading house, tally sticks. So, yeah, that's real good. So the, uh, the Bitcoin has much more notoriety, I want to say, as opposed to the tally It has more utilitarian 
I mean, yeah, because you can use it as money. You know, like I am actually, I have a, a name called Coin King, local Bitcoins. And I've actually gone, you can go to a McDonald's or whatever, and I've got all this Bitcoin, and somebody wants to buy it from me, and we just check the market price, and we do a transfer, you know, right there. They'll give me 50 bucks, and they'll give me $50 worth of Bitcoin. So, you know, so, so. Notoriety, not uh, utility. Is, no. Oh, uh, world, it's worldwide actually. I mean, as it opposed be, to the tally stick. As opposed to the tally stick. That's the, the main thing about the tally stick is it's a closed ecosystem here with whoever's participating. Bitcoin is not that way. Bitcoin is a universal life gold or silver or hundred dollar gold. Anywhere bills with it, it's international. There's no boundaries. It is international. It's there, not local. Yeah, it's, it's more you can transfer a million dollars worth of Bitcoin to you or to someone in Tokyo right now on the phone. And it's there and it's that value. He can go locally there if he wants to turn it into local currency and get you know, buy it from someone who already has it. Okay. And there are a bunch of websites. You can actually turn Bitcoin into cash by going to these websites, like let's say if you want to buy something off of Amazon or you want to buy something you know, you know, from Barnes and Noble or whatever, and there are websites that you can go to, I don't have enough on my head, where they will actually chain, convert, you, you use your Bitcoin to convert it into a gift card for like Barnes and Noble or for Amazon or whatever. When the banks have closed in Cyprus, what's that? I think when the banks are closed in Cyprus, they actually set up Oh, they do have a, there is an ATM coming for Bitcoin. It's kind of a misnomer. It's just a machine that you can that acts like an exchange. Where instead of having to call somebody or meet them on an exchange and go to a coffee house, it'll spit out Federal Reserve notes, and they're just put, or you you know deposit them in, or buy, or use a credit card. But as you go into that realm, you start getting less and less private. That's the whole thing about Bitcoin. It's completely private. If, I, if you were to buy Bitcoin from me, nobody knows but me and you. You gave me cash. You know, that's the way it works. And that is a way to protect uh, privacy. But I believe in gold, silver, and Bitcoin. And what I do is I take a third, a third, and a third. Well, there's real estate too. But that's the There's no way of hiding real estate. So you take a third, a third, and a third. Bitcoin, which is cash, gold and silver, and then you just keep it balanced and save your money that way. And that's, that's one way to be completely off the grid as far as your money goes. Because your money is, you're tracked with your money no matter what you do, especially if you're using credit cards and stuff. This is actually kind of like a credit card, only there's no trail, there's no paper trail. So, any instance, does Bitcoin has a certain well, it has the value that the market assigns it, just like a dollar has a value. Yeah, like if you it's it's kind of like yeah, the, when you're thinking of currency, you actually have to kind of think globally because, like, the dollar is worth well, a dollar, this or that in the store. Well, if you were European and came here with euros, you'd have to convert it into dollars. But they have a value that's based against the dollar, so it's kind of irrelevant to think of. Bitcoin, kind of like gold not really having a value. Gold doesn't really have a value, it's just that it's rare and people... No, that, actually gold, no, it has to do, it has to do with what the dollar is worth. What, what? Gold? 35 years ago was worth 35, 40 dollars. Digital money. What does the government want? They want you to go to digital money. No, it operates outside of their system. They don't have any control over it. They have shut the internet down in the Midwest in the last week. You're telling me you can control us? No, you cannot. No, I said you can't control it. You can't control it. They've already proven that they can do that. No, they can't. If I, if I give you fifty dollars here, how can they control it? It's the same thing. They're gonna wipe out. How? How? They'd have to wipe out every computer that has it. They'd have to shut them all down. They can't do it. What about all the computers in Tokyo? The ones in Hong Kong, the ones in Australia, and the ones in Europe, and the ones in the Netherlands, and the ones.
in South America. How are they going to do that? They can't. They can't. They can't really control. They can wipe them out. Yeah. Okay. And then wiping it out. There's going to be a whole lot of other <laughs> whether, whether or not they can get into it, because I don't really know. They can. They can. It's encryption. I'm not explaining it right. But they can. There's no 100% guarantee. If they could, if they could, there would be no file sharing sites on the web. If they could, there would be no.